Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, and I'm your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we believe on the show that the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who live and work there. That is why we are honored to have our guest onto the show today. Please help me welcome to the show, Mayor Robert Fair of the Village of Alex in the province of Alberta. Robert, welcome to the show. Rob? <laughs> Thanks for having me. So, Rob, I want to start with the question that I've started all these interviews off, so you're no exception. Where'd your sense of duty to serve come from? That's a good question. Um, you know, I think it's um, probably from right from my youth. Um, I grew up in small town Saskatchewan. Um, so back in those days, and I mean, it sounds like a long time ago for some maybe, but, um, you know, it was, we we're kind of an isolated community. So it wasn't like we had a lot of the services that, you know, larger communities have. Um, so we kind of learned to look out for each other and help each other where we could. And to this day, even when I do go back there, you still see a, a lot of that there. Um, and I think that's probably where that kind of all what was fostered from, um, you know, just having that ability to look out for each other and help each other. And I just kind of carried it forward, I guess. One of the reasons why we started the show is to learn about why people do what they do. So you got involved in municipal politics. What was the desire and draw to municipal politics? You could have chosen provincial or federal, but you went municipally. Why so? Uh, well, I think for me, it's it's more the grassroots um, component. Um, you know, you, who better to, you know, work with... Uh, to make your community better than at a municipal level, right? It's uh, you kind of get to know all walks of life and you kind of get to know the people in your community, what their needs are, what sort of things they would like to see, um, you know, good and bad. Of course, everybody has their own opinion, but to me, that was where you get your most bang for your buck is kind of uh, the grassroots level. And quite oh. simply, that's, that's where I enjoy it. Now, I, I've, I've tried to do some research on the village of Alex and try to find election results because I want to know when you first were elected. All I can find back is to 2017 and 2021. When were, when did you first put your name on the first ballot? 2007. 2007. So I want to go back to 2007. What was happening in the village that made you decide, okay, 2007, this is the time that Rob's going to put his name on the ballot. Um, at that time, there there was a lot of uh, I guess polarizing issues at that time. I I think at that time there was prior to that there was a lot of voter apathy. Nobody really wanted to step up and be part of it. So you kind of had people that threw their hat in the ring, and I mean, good on them to do that. Um, but they were kind of faced with some real issues at the time. Um, you know, there were some water issues as far as drinking water. So it was run on a well system. The wells were drying up. So they had to look at a different uh, process to get drinking water to the community. Um, so there there was that. There was also a real um, lightning rod for uh, some discontent, as it were. Um, there was talk at the time about they wanted to tear down the community hall and they wanted to bring in some low income housing and uh, you know and i'm not not saying that was a bad thing but there was there i don't know that it was as well thought out as it could have been um i think back then the transparency part of it wasn't there there were some decisions made that maybe weren't as researched as well as it could have been and that did not sit well in small town redneck alberta if you <laughs> want to be so bold i guess um but it, it it didn't impress a lot of people because they didn't feel like they had a voice in it. They didn't really feel that was something that they we had the means to really put together anyway. And the thought was, was like, well, they're going to start bringing people in from the larger centers and just plop them in town. And, you know, so they and they didn't want to lose their community hall. And I, and I agree that was 
they kind of used the argument that it was a it was a horribly sh you know a, a not in great shape it was you know decrepit and it needed to go which it wasn't um you know engineers had come in and did their part uh, we had them come in um kind of uh, on the side and it wasn't it needed some work but nothing significant um and there's again going back to the volunteerism there were people that stepped up and um you know did some work in it and you know did some stuff with it um the engineers said you know what here's some a few things that you can deal with and uh it's just going to be um, you you bring up a good work. You bring up a good uh, segue into this uh, this part of the first segment, and I want to know, as someone who has been on uh, the village council for some time, now in the role of as mayor, how do you balance the needs of the community with the needs of the growth of the community? Because I think that's the biggest challenge that municipalities are facing right now. Like you said, going back to that issue of the community hall, you had people saying, well, it's good now, but there might have been people on council saying we need to grow our community we need bigger better how do you balance that and how does your current council balance that uh there's probably a few moving parts and pieces to that um you know no two are alike um in in so far as communities but at the same token there's a lot of parallels um you know i guess to kind of make things work i, I think the big thing is is and this is becoming more and more prevalent than it ever used to be is is more public participation right you, people want to be heard people want to know that they have a have a, a voice in what's going on in their communities they they trust their leaders to make the decisions ultimately but they want to know that their their hopes their concerns um their vision is actually something that's going to be uh, out there and taken into consideration when these decisions are made. So we've always made a concerted effort. And I mean, we've had some change in council and, and I guess for me, I'm kind of the dinosaur now. I'm the longest serving one there. Um, you know, but I don't lose sight of the fact that you, you got to stay with the times. You got to know what the needs are. Um, what the opportunities and try and entice development and growth where you can, if there's companies that are looking, we are lucky in that we are in a, in a economic engine of Canada, really Alberta being what it is. Um, and even for us, we're, we're located in, and we're a little bit far from red deer, but we also on our spot that there's a lot of opportunity for industrial growth too. So, um, and I can't speak, for other communities of, of that scale but i think for us it was you know working with people the transparency obviously that's a buzzword and it's true it is a thing people want to know what's going on but they also want to be a voice in it too so we you always are cognizant of that and you're always trying to make the best decisions with the information you have too right so I don't how do you give people a voice in today's age because social media is such a polarizing era of today's society I'm not sure if it's if it's it, it, uh as prominent in smaller villages like Alex but is how do you give voices is it public hearings is it town halls is it giving opportunities when you're at the grocery store that someone can stop you and say hey rob i have an issue and i want to talk to you about this issue and i want to get your opinion what are the mechanisms that you and the town or the village sorry has put in place to make sure people do get heard yes to everything you suggested <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah you know thankfully when you are in a smaller community you're you're going to be a little more available than a larger center right i mean that just comes with the with the territory it's you're you're a lot more visible so you're not to coin a phrase you're a bigger fish in a small fishbowl kind of thing but you you are kind of because you 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 have a smaller population and we all go to the same businesses or the same events um, whatever. And, and, you know, for me, I always try and make myself as available as possible too. Um, but, you know, we do a lot of reaching out. So the town hall stuff, like you said, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, does, does the apathy come into the play there as well? Because you say about voter apathy, I worked in a municipality in Northern Alberta, and I can tell you there was the same five people at the public hearings or town hall meetings all the time. 
And when something passes, people are upset. But when you give them the opportunity, they won't come out and go to the town hall meetings or the public hearings. Is it the same in even smaller communities like a village? Yes and no. I think it depends on what the topic or the issue of the day <laughs> is. Some things, you're right, they could care less. They're like, you know what, I don't know, it's whatever you guys know it's best, go ahead and do it. Um, but again, depends on the issue. Um, if it's something that's a little more uh, affects more people, um, then they you you will see a little larger gathering. But honestly, we over the last however many years there hasn't been much. I know I can I can say for my last uh, probably last five six years it, there hasn't been a lot. Um, and you're always going to have your token people too that that. Uh, will find fault in everything you say and do anyway. What? Um, Voters are all, right. all, always 100% on the side of politicians? Come on, Rob, what are you talking about? <laughs> right? Um, and you know what? That's their right. And that's that's kind of the beauty of of being in the the, the community we are, but the, the, the country we're in too, that you have the right and the ability to do that. Um, you know, and it kind of keeps you a little bit honest too, I suppose, because you, you know, People are watching and, and they're they're invested and good for you to be invested. I'd rather that than just, you know, not. Um you know, now, it's me, yeah, it's it's good. I wanna I wanna ask about the the responsibility of a mayor and council for yourself. Going into that council chambers every week or bi weekly or however many times you you hold council meetings a month, you have a weight and responsibility on your shoulders to make sure you give the best decision possible with the information that's provided and with the information gathered. How much of a weight do you put on yourself to make sure that you are educated, but also informed on the decisions that you're about to make? Because you would be affecting someone's pocketbook, whether it comes taxes, whether it be service levels to uh, some uh, key services that the village may provide. What responsibility do you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chambers? Well, it's obviously you're you're the you're the uh, chief operating officer, really. So really, it, it's you take great responsibility and great pride in that, too, because you you are representing a number of people that pay um, taxes and, you know, rely on good services to come out of that. So, you know, it, it it's it's difficult at times because what you may want to see with your tax dollars may not be something that individual wants. Um, so you, you know, you, you really research things carefully. Um, you don't make any decisions in haste. Um, I will say this as well. Um, the, the other really important player in all this that doesn't get enough credit and they can kind of make or break counsel too, is your chief operating officer or, or your CAO, I should say, um, chief administrative officer, the CAO, city manager, town manager, whatever title you want to bestow them. But they are the ones that are doing a lot of the legwork between them and their staff. When we ask the questions or when there's things that come up, they do a lot of the work to find out, okay, what, what can or can't you do? What's the cost? All the good parts to this. Um, we rely on them a lot too. So if they're really invested and they're really um, working in your you know, best interest to get all that information that helps immensely. Um, I mean, we got to do our homework too, but I'll tell you what, they're, they are huge. And if you don't have a very um, uh, invested uh, uh, CAO, um, you can make your job a lot harder. Um, you know, and then, or, sorry. You bring up a good point, and I want to know about the respect aspect of between those two positions as mayor and CAO. That is the one uh, position in the administration that is technically the staff of council. Right. You hire the CAO and the CAO hires everyone else. But right. as you as the mayor, how much do you put respect into that role of CAO to ensure that they operate the village to the best of your ability. So that way you're not in the nitty gritty because you're not supposed to be in the weeds into the day-to-day -day operations of the village that you say, I respect this position enough that they're going in there and doing it correctly. You know, that, that is a learning curve that I had to learn 
early on. Um, we've had some uh, CAOs that I would suggest that probably weren't as maybe qualified or as, as invested as they could have been um, for whatever reason. Um, it, and it's really no different than any other industry. When you hire an individual, you kind of go by their um, education, their experience, their references. That one page and, resume. <laughs> yeah. And let's be honest. Sometimes you get a dud. Um, what? And, yeah. I believe it. So, you know, and, and not to bash anybody because that's not what it's about, but sometimes it may, may maybe it's just not the right fit. Perhaps it's, uh, you know, they're just, they, they, they weren't as advertised sometimes. There, there could be a few uh, things at play there that, that lend itself to uh, maybe not as good of individual in that role, but, um, but I, I, what I've learned out of all of it is that now you kind of get to know what questions to ask, um, kind of, uh, pull them into the, the conversations more to kind of get a little bit better feel and then kind of really watch what they can and can't do. Um, and I, and I, you know, and like I said, now I, I really feel blessed in that we do have a really good CAO in position right now. Uh, she's been there now, I think, better part of like almost six years, five, six years. Um, very, um, I can't say enough good things. She's been really, uh, uh, gives us good information. She researches things very carefully. She's very by the book, uh, you know, with the MGA. Like it's, there's, if she's not sure, she'll find out the answers. She doesn't just give you an answer for the sake of giving an answer. Um, you know, doesn't have a box so much. She's, she's just very, very invested, very uh, um, involved and, and willing to help people as well. So it's just a, a very good fit. Um, and we're lucky to have that. And I know that's kind of always an issue. And it's not like they're falling out of the, the sky. Um, you know, a lot of CAOs typically, the start of their careers, um, maybe they don't have the experience and stuff, or you get adversely the other side of the coin where they want to work in larger centers. They don't want to work in small communities, right? They want to go to the Red Deer's, Calgary, Edmonton, whatever. Um, so the pool is a little tighter, but there is a lot of good ones out there. You just got to know what to look for and what to ask. So I want to I want to jump into our second segment here, and I want to talk about the village as a whole. And before I start this segment, I want to preface this question by saying this: This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a decision of the council. This is not a motion of council. This is not a uh, bylaw at council. This is his opinion talking to the host of the cross border interviews. We get a lot of questions about this for some strange reason. Um, but Mayor Fair, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the village of Alex today as of recording? Well, we got a couple at play. Um, one, we're, we're working on a um, lagoon um, issue right now. So kind of, you know, wastewater, um, you know, sewage, that type of thing. Um it, it's it's a little um, bit of a process to do it. It's not like you just dig a hole in the ground and say run your pipes and dump it. There 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 is quite a uh, process, and it's it, it's something that nobody thinks about until you don't have it. Um, <laughs> you know, everybody likes to have nice paved streets and nice facilities and stuff, but you know, it's the stuff that you don't see that is a big, big thing that you really want and need. You just don't see it all the time until, until it's gone. So uh, that's been a bit of an issue to try and it, it is not cheap to do as you can well imagine right now with the economy being what it is. And, and, you know, you're looking at uh, cost of material and, and mobilization and um, you know, when you tender that out, well, costs have gone up exponentially. Um, sorry about that. Um, it's been uh it's been a challenge. Um, we're making some headway. I'm, I'm pleased to say, um, but we're getting that done out. Um, the other issue, and I think this is something a lot of small communities face is that how do you draw people into your community? What, what sorts of things um, will help move that obviously industry. So we try and entice uh, development as far as, you know, in, in 
whether it's commercial or in, industrial, uh, you know, or even just a mom and pop business kind of thing. But, um, you know, you're always, you're always trying to promote that wherever you can and get people to come in. And I'd like to think we have a lot of uh, great things going for us that will, you know, entice that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, as things move forward in this economy, I, I'd like to think it'll it'll become more and more. I want to talk about the first issue that you talked about, which yes. is the sewage lagoon. But yes. I want to talk. I want to talk about it as an overarching issue because you are right. The cost of doing business is going up, but villages like yours and communities like yours still need to grow, and they still need to build these sewage lagoons. That means that you're going to have to look at budget and budget is always yeah. the toughest thing to do when you're particularly looking at a community after the last few years that we've had. How does the village of Alex and yourself as mayor lead the budget discussion when realizing that the cost of living is going up, but our tax base is not changing because we we may not have as many people as we want to do these larger projects while grants are available is there days where you have to say, okay, I would love to do this project, but due to the financial situation that the economy is in, we have to change and we have to not do it this year. And we may have to do it two years from now, or do you just have to sort of steamroll through and do it all at once and hope that it doesn't cost an arm and a leg? Yes. <laughs> um, I, love, know, I love when guests agree with me on statements <laughs> that I <used> to say. <laughs> It's a challenge, granted, but you know, here's the thing, and, and it, there's a few layers to this. I think you 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 need to be proactive too. So you know you have infrastructure. You so you really got to monitor in what condition uh, that infrastructure's in and be ahead of it. So basically, how much time do I have? So, I mean, you're going to get some surprises. Obviously, you can't help that, but but a, a large amount of the time. Um, you kind of know what your lifespan is for some of this stuff. And so you plan ahead, your capital plan, um, you better have one because you need to have, you know, five, 10 years out. So you got to know how much money to set aside every year, factor in inflation. Um, you know, obviously you're, you're not going to foot the load entirely. Um, small municipalities, it's not like it used to be. Um, we, we do rely on provincial and federal funding it's not as and it's the age of you guys i uh, sorry sorry to interrupt but does that hurt villages like yours when you yeah. rely so heavily on provincial and federal funding and and i'm not trying to bash any political party or level of government here but I, I i'm not trying to burst your bubble but your population is what's determining where the money goes so they'll spend money in an airdrie a red deer but when they look at the village of alex they'll go okay well you don't have the population base that we would want to spend two million dollars in when we go spend two million dollars in red deer and it'll affect more people does that hurt you yeah of course it does and it does every small municipality because it's you know and, and it's the age-old issue it's urban versus rural um you know, because they always are always looking and making try to make themselves heard with with whether it's provincial or, or federal. Um, you know, we don't forget about us because you know there are people that live here and there's people that and, and not necessarily the community itself, but rural being we have a lot of people that rely on the services in town that don't reside in the village or small town, right? So they might not want to go to Red Deer or whatever they may want to come into the small town like what we have because it's close by um you know they want to support local and yeah, for whatever reason right so it's there is even though you got a population base of roughly 800 and whatever there's a lot of people that in and around the area that that come into town and utilize those services as well so going back to you know the the province and the funding yeah you're always trying to make your voice heard and they have changed the formulas now, as you probably know. Yeah. Um, so that has impacted um, municipalities as well, smaller ones. Um, you know, and it's you you really pit, put your best foot forward uh, and explain the benefits of it and, you know, why we need it. Um, you know, and, and obviously in this day and age, depending on the project, you know, you're starting to look at environmental issues. Um you know, some economic drivers, um, you know, that we do have industry in that too. 
um, that isn't just you know w w working just with the community, but it, it's it's almost uh, outside of Alberta, even the markets that they contribute to. So it's it's uh, it's important to have those those infrastructure and sorry infrastructure uh, components in place. Um, but it is a challenge to to get that money and get these things done. So you got to manage it very carefully. You have to plan ahead. And yeah, you work with your neighboring partners on these issues, because I can imagine you have to work as a region sometimes and not just as the village, because that may take your the money a little bit further. Like when you're updating the sewage lagoon, it's not just going to affect the people of the village, but it's going to affect some of the rural areas around you as well. Does it not? Mm, yes and no. Um, really? The lagoon part of it really is kind of tied into the village alone. So, I okay. mean, rural is they got their own um sewage systems in place um but you know it, it's um it, it's always kind of a challenge especially when you start talking sewage and wastewater or or water obviously but to answer your question i guess a little more clearly it's it collaboration is big so any opportunity we can get to collaborate with other communities in the area uh, maybe even the county um the province you, you, you certainly it's in your best interest to do that um and i also and i'm sure you know this the provinces anytime they hear collaboration they're they're all over it so they they like that and i get it uh, wherever you can do that by all means i think you should you talked about the retention and attraction of residents to smaller communities like yours. How do you do that in today's age when we see more young people moving to larger urban centers, going away to university or college, and then not coming back? There might be a few that straggle back, but overall, the the youth and I and I see I feel so old when I say this question, but I like I I've never felt more older than I do right now asking this question. How do you retain residents? when our youth are leaving the the areas that they reside in and they grow up in that's an age-old problem though isn't it um i i guess so i i'm not living in my hometown anymore so i guess i guess that's own, a true right? question and a lot yeah. of us do it we go we we want to strike out into the world to go do the things we want to do see the places we want to see or for whatever reason right um a lot of times they do leave and you know they go where the work is or the or the experiences they want and i get that um but you know that for us and, and even for me um i like small town especially when you're going to raise children that's a big thing we have a uh, k-12 to school um you know the arena is a very big uh you know important thing for a lot of people um you know so with a, with a school and arena those are two really big things that families want um you know, and then try and entice more of the more business, whether it's retail or whether it's, you know, industry. We, we, we're lucky. We do have some really good uh, um, commercial and, and, and industrial type stuff in, in town. Um, you know, we got a few things working for us. We do have we're not too far up the Highway 2 corridor, but we're right on Highway 12, Highway 11, Highway 21 going north and south. CP and CN. uh uh, intersect in town as well so i mean rail is right there um you know there's there's a lot of opportunity that the tax rates were kind of middle of the road and we pride ourselves on trying to keep a, a reasonable tax base with no increases um does growth yeah, come into play as well? Does does growth come into play? Because earlier in the interview, you talked about low income housing. While it was not, in, uh, it was a touchy subject in that two thousand seven election. Growth is a, a big concern for a lot of people because there may not be houses, and if there are houses, they may be out of reach for some people to afford. In the village of Alex, does growth come into play of that attraction as well? Is there places where people can come in and say, I want to build a subdivision or I want to build a, uh, an area where I can gr uh, raise my family for 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now and maybe even retire in? Yes. Um, so as far as as the market itself, it is kind of an ebb and flow kind of situation. <laughs> um, you know, you'll have time when you'll start to see a lot more on the market and then it starts to you know, they dry up. Um, I mean, as it stands today, there's there's not a lot available on the market for sale. Um, but we do have uh, 
a subdivision that that has been developed um, and, and they're kind of coming it's a private development but they are selling lots in there so we've have, now we're starting to see some residential you know come come into there um you know as far as development there is opportunity for that there is a uh, it's private owned but there is right on the lake um which is another selling feature it's a you know people like water right and they want to be by water so it's there is that opportunity to someone to kind of step up and, and look at you know talking to us about development in there um you know, and it's, with the lake, there's there's a lot. Do you of, see a silver lining in this whole issue? Do you see a silver lining where people may like it's not happening, it may not be happening right now, but 10, 15 years down the line, you may see those people who went to the cities after the last few years of everything that happened move back to these rural communities like yours. I'd like to think so. Um, you know, I think there's a few things you got to consider. You know, the fact that interest rates being you know on the climb inflation um you know and, and we lived in the city for a number of years my wife and i um you know we started having our own family not to bash uh, larger communities but let's face do it, it kind of do it come on rob do yeah. it <laughs> you, you look at the lots they're small you're you're kind of on top of your neighbors so you really are it's it's just people want to get away from the rat race a little bit um you know, and you're in there and you, so, you, you know, you want to be in a smaller community, maybe where there's more space, you can be in and out of town like that. Um, you know, the services that you like, even if you don't have it, at least they're close by. Um, so it's, it is kind of a perfect world. That's kind of why we did it. Raising kids. It was, that's why we got out of the city. And, and I grew up on a farm in Saskatchewan. So me and city was, it was a bit of a challenge. Um I like my space and, and it kind of offered the best of both worlds. It was in a residential setting, but it had a very rural feel to it, which meant a lot to me. Um, so, so I, I think wanna, people will look at that a lot more favorably than ever before. I want to talk about the issues you talked about your, you, what you believe in your opinion are the big issues of the day for the village. But if I go talk to a hundred people in your community or even 10 people in your community, they're all going to give me something different, whether it be healthcare, whether it be education, whether it be uh, like you said, infrastructure or retention of people, but they also will give us some micro issues. Like that pothole on my street is the worst <laughs> pothole in the community and I need it fixed. But you as mayor have to look at the micro issues and the macro issues and decide at the end of the day when it comes to budgeting who the winners and losers are. Because you can't fix every pothole in your community. I don't care how big or small your community is. You do not have the money to do it. And I'm not bursting any bubbles here, anyone. Some reason people think everyone, the municipalities just have the unlimited amount of money. Um, how do you as mayor and council prioritize and look at the issues that are important to the people who have elected you and balance them with the need for the, the growth of the village as a whole. Again, not bursting your bubble that people talk about potholes. I, I don't think, am I right there? Oh, I'm sure they do. And I imagine that's never going to change. And it's probably been around since there were. Since streets were formed. <laughs> I'm sure the Romans battled the same thing. You know, you lose a wheel in your chariot. It's a thing. Um, you know, it, it's uh, when you talk about micro issues, I think you have to really consider um, a few things, too. It's like, is it is it impacting the safety of the community or, or a residents? So you have to look at that component. You have to look at is it part of a, of a bigger um, plan that that micro may be part of a macro plan, as you say, um so it, it's kind of on the radar it's just not going to be tomorrow it it is going to get dealt with it just may not be as soon and and ultimately too you got to pick and choose the more i guess critical infrastructure needs to more, the, some of the others right um and you're never going to please everyone so you're going to get those that are that's always going to be the kind of the torch they carry is is the potholes but um everyone you know it depends on too you got to look at it how, how big of an issue is it is you only get a couple complaining about it or, or making issue of it or is it a little more rampant well the old adage squeaky wheel gets the grease right so if people are, are really making it 
an issue, then it's an issue. You got to step up and deal with it. And I'm fine with that. I, I mean, I'd rather have people talk about it and ask the questions or, or voice concerns than not say anything. And then, you know, then it turns into something. And I think that is the most upset. honest answer I've ever gotten from that question from the 500 and semi 50 episodes I've done of this show. You were the first person to say, you know what? Sometimes the loudest voice does win because if you ask and ask and ask, it does become an issue and you have to resolve sure it. So it, like, I, I'm shocked that a politician answered an honest question here. What is this all about? <laughs> and I have no problem saying this. And, and I think if you went around and you talked to people in town and maybe that's what uh, I, I, and I pride myself on it. I don't mince words. If it's, if it's, I mean, obviously within reason, but I, I try and be as upfront and honest as possible. You may not like what I tell you. You may like not like the answer, but Hey, you asked. And honestly, if I can, wave a wand and fix it. Hey, I'm all for it. But sometimes, you know, you got to work within the parameters you're given, but I'll, I'll give you an answer. I'm not going to skirt it. Is it hard to say no in your job? I can imagine <laughs> there's people who come to your, you and say, we need a new park in this area, but it's going to cost $2 million. And that's just not in the budget. Is it hard to say no? Yes and no. Depends on what the issue is. And I'll use this as the example. So we have a very, aged arena so it was built it, it was it was uh the boys came home from world war ii and said uh, hey we need somewhere to play hockey and skates and stuff let's build an arena so god bless them they they did a fantastic job in this thing and it's had its um you know add-ons and whatever too but they built a really good structure back in the day um and it's still in use to this day but it's 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 old right um it's had its issues and you know you resolve as best you can and it, it is a very good functioning and safe arena i might add um it's good but you know people would love a new arena and have you know some of the the uh, things in it that some of the other communities have the, the multi-use type things but let's be honest um we're, we're 800 and some odd people um and you know at the cost of an arena just an arena never mind multi-use so you're into millions of dollars um that that doesn't just uh, happen on tax dollars. I like guess unless you're willing to pay an astronomical amount of taxes, which I'm not, uh, <laughs> it's just not feasible. I'd love to say we could. I'd love to say of an indoor swimming pool, but it would be awesome. But it's just not in the in the cards. We don't have the budget to do that unless we're going to get a, a boatload of money from the feds and the province. Which I mean, recreation is good, but they're more focused on infrastructure needs and. And that too, right? So, uh, yeah, we we've had a push back in the day, um, you know, getting this new arena, and they they come in and said, "Oh, yeah, it's what we're gonna do." And how much? And like, well, that's wonderful. Who's paying for it? Um, you know, like, oh, well, here's the processes you're doing it to get that. I'm like, yeah, no, that's you know. And then when it really rubber met the road, it kind of disappeared. And yeah, it wasn't like they said. And and it's it's difficult. It would be nice to have those things. But it's just not realistic in this day and in age. In this day and age. No, understandable. Goes back and collaboration. Again, I, I really make that clear. Collaboration is huge. And sometimes you're going to have to join forces with other communities or groups to develop some of these things where everybody's involved, not just, you know, each community having its own whatever. You, you may have to look at a collaborative effort and so be it. Is that where the intermunicipal agreements come into play here? Because I can imagine uh, the village like yours uh, dealing with a, while your base is only 800, you have people who come into your community. You have people who come into your community, use the lake, who come into your community and shop at some of maybe some of the mom and pa stores. Is that where those intermunicipal agreements or does even the village of Alex have an intermunicipal agreement with some of their uh, surrounding communities? For, yeah, for certain aspects i guess um you know it, it's we're part of the 1221 water commission so that's kind of a collaborative thing in the sense that we're all involved and pay whatever fees to to get that water to us um you know emergency management uh fire suppression you know for the fire department stuff so there's that municipal uh, mutual aid agreements if you will um so yeah there there is a there is there a lot of that um do I think it could improve? Yeah, I think I think you're going to see more and more of it because I, I, I don't think you really have a choice whether you like it or not. Um, it, I think it's something that's going to need to happen because with the cost of 
you know, the world we're in now, let's face it, material and, and services and everything. It's inflation, interest rates, all that stuff. It's, it's, it, she's a little pricey. So you're going to have to find creative ways to make these things work more than you ever have in the past. And I think that's, that's going to, you're going to see more and more of that. Oh, I lost you. You're on mute. I muted myself by accident. So cut that out, Chris Brown. Good job. So um, I want to turn to my next segment. And before I do that, I want to say this. We are airing, we are recording this at the end of March, but this will be airing in April. And by the time this airs, this will be a few weeks away from the provincial election. And with municipal issues as the key theme of my show, I want to know from mayors like you, from small town mayors, rural mayors and Reeves, what would you want the provincial parties to be addressing for municipalities like you? So I, I know I'm putting you on the spot here. I probably you probably not were prepared for this question, but I want to know what are you hoping to hear from any of the leaders who are coming out and talking about municipal issues? How much time you got? Um, as long as you want, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's right now. And I see it across Canada, but uh, let's use Alberta as, obviously as the as the study here. But it's gotten so polarizing right now, um, and that to me it's kind of a symptom of of other jurisdictions across North America. Um, it, it, everything's kind of swung really to the right and to the left. Um, to me, and this is my own opinion, small C conservatism is is kind of. A, not as as uh, present and maybe as visible as it once was, so it, it it's kind of difficult. You're trying to play both sides of the fence a little bit in that you want to you don't want to alienate anybody either, but you you kind of want to make your voice heard. Um, so I guess for for and, and and honestly, in this province as it stands today, it's kind of a two party um, race. Honestly, I mean, there's going to have pockets of other perhaps, but, um, you know, we know the two prevalent parties in play right now. And, and I would hope um, we're going to, we have a new a UCP candidate that's that's going to run. Um, the, the former is is retiring. Um, and then, you know, our NDP candidate, which I believe is a, is an, a new one as well. Um, so. You know, it's obviously for them, this is a rural riding. Um, it's not Edmonton or Calgary or, or maybe some of the other larger. Well, your issues are still important. As much as Edmonton and Calgary are important and everyone seems to be focusing on them, communities like yours still have people in them. And I want people to understand that there is a lot of people outside of Calgary and Edmonton. While you may only be one seat for a large area, you still yeah. matter. You betcha. And I and I look at it and I think, you know, don't forget about us because we're big economic contributors to this economy as well. And we have, you know, a lot of different services and, you know, industrial uh, services that we deliver that is a big part of moving our economies forward, too. So don't just because we don't live in Edmonton and Calgary doesn't mean we don't contribute. And. You know, we're proud Albertans too, and we, and for me, we we want to be a uh, a very united, and that's not necessarily mean you're going to agree with the policies and, and things, but you're also going to be, we're Albertans first, and we need to work together to make this place continue to grow, and the only way to do that is that you got to invest in in all of us and participate and listen at least to what we contribute. Um, yeah, maybe yeah. you're not getting the, the no, vote. I, we're, we're big contributors too. I appreciate you answering that question. I've been starting to ask it to more and more mayors and Reeves who have been coming on the show. So thank you so much, Rob. But I want to turn to my last segment because I am cautious of time here. And I want to talk about tourism. I love tourism. If you come on my show, I'm coming to your community. So I will be in your community spending my economic dollars later on this year. So as a tourist and as, as I have listeners from across Canada around the world, what should people do in the village of Alex if they come as a tourist? Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> let's talk about that. You know, there, there are a lot of things in play here that, that I feel it's that 
a lot of people enjoy. And I always, always say this, we're kind of a hidden jewel. And if you ever look on our website, I think you'll see a kind of a, a little blurb there that I made back when that does talk about it. It is a hidden jewel. It's, it's got a lot of cool recreational things that people aren't even aware of in, in Red Deer. Um, there's people that haven't even heard of Alex, never mind this, the, the recreational stuff that we have. So we got a, um, it is starting to become a lot more known. I, I will say that. Um, we have a lake there, obviously. It, it has a beach playground. Um, you know, there's activities that go on down there. And it's not like, and not to bash another community in central Alberta that has a lake and nice beach and whatever, but let's face it, it's pretty uh, touristy and it's very crowded. Um, we don't have that as much. And so there's there's stuff that can be done out there, boating, um, you know, canoeing. Uh, it's it's very in touch with the natural or sort of the nature and natural side of life, I guess. It has about a six and a half kilometer walking trail around it. So you get to see a lot of different wildlife species um, and just really in touch with, with nature and, you know, the trees and different uh, um environmental things that you will come across on a nature trail very popular it's, there's folks that come from all over canada really uh, we've had international um we're putting in a new bridge to go over uh, an area um you know because will all kinds of cool stuff you can picnics and you can do whatever around this trail it's really it's really awesome we have a nine hole uh, golf course that's on the shores of haunted lake just just out of town I mean, it's just on the outskirts um, very popular, really nice nine hole course. Um, you know, the ag society out there, there's rodeo grounds. Um, there's events out there. Um, so, I, so I've got to ask the question that kind of sparked why I approached you for this interview, because I found out through conversations with other tourist people that your community has a mascot called Alex, the alligator. Now, That's I was waiting for the the story of how a village in the province of Alberta has a mascot called Alex the Alligator. Do you know this backstory? And why, oh, why is that not on every single tourist brochure that Travel Alberta has? Because I think that is the best marketing I've ever seen. <laughs> it is. It has. And it, you'll probably see it more. You'll see it when we have like Alex days in the summer as the, the mascot comes out. Um, so, the, yeah, the gator makes their appearance and wanders around and whatever. But the story, I've heard a couple of versions of it and they they differ. But the one that I heard that seems to have a little more uh, traction to it was back in the day, um, kids like to go to swim in the lake and whatever. And when, when mom said, you know what, it's time to come in now, it's whatever. And the kids think don't want to come in. I want to swim and I want whatever. So what better way than to get a kid out of the water and say, Hey, you know, there's an alligator in there that whatever. And you know, Oh, so of course, you know, sad child decides to bail the lake and whatever. And it, I guess from what I'm all accounts, it, it's kind of uh the urban it's legend own from there. So whether that's true or not, I, I can't really say, but it, I like the story. I thought, yeah, that's, that's, that's one way to motivate your kid, I guess. But, do you have an Alex, like, do you have it like an Alex, the alligator sculpture within the city? Because if so, I need oh, to come yeah. see this like tomorrow. <laughs> oh, well then you need to come see Gator park then. Um, it's, it's right on the end of main street. Um, it's right by the uh, Alex area resource center, uh, the end of main street. So yeah, there's a big gator there, um, and we have Wi-Fi there, so people can kind of go and sit and have a, you know, do whatever they do, um, sit and veg, go visit, uh, have a picnic around there. There's, there's, you know, it's kind of a nice little uh, uh, spot to go and, you know, kick your feet back and whatever, and hang out with the uh, with the gator. And yeah, it is pretty cool. Um, it has done, it had a major ma facelift uh, this past uh, summer and fall um the finishing touches this year but yeah it's it's uh quite well i will received, I, I will certainly come out and see alex the alligator at alligator or at gator park which is you guys have the best marketing strategy if i've ever heard it but i want to know from you though after a stressful day after a long day at work after a long day at council after a long day of just being mayor 
Where do you go into the town to decompress? Where do you go to just get away from it all and just let all the stress of the day go away? Uh, that's a good question. You know, sometimes it's just out for a walk, take the dog for a walk or, or go down to the trail. Um, sometimes it's just visiting you know, friends. Uh, my family means the world to me too. So I, I have a couple young daughters at home yet. So even for us, this sometimes uh, kicking back, relaxing, um, you know, maybe drive down to the river as well. It's not far away. Um, you know, stuff, stuff like that. Uh, family's important. Um, if, if my family said, you know what, Rob, that's enough of this, then I would respect that. And that would be it. Um, so I kind of get their blessing to do this. Um, and every time election rolls around, I always put it out there, you know, what, what's your feeling? Do you want me to keep doing this? Uh, I've had people ask me to keep whatever, but if it gets to the point where, uh, you know, and I also like to, um, I think experience is big, but I also like, I, I'm, I like to see new counselors come in. I'm not going to do this forever either. Obviously it's always good to have new ideas and, and new blood in there too. Um, but I, I do like the continuity of, of kind of making things, uh, you know, experience counts for something and, and, uh, balance big thing is balance, right? It's, uh, uh, it's it's kind of how make uh, how makes life go. While we have talked for the last fifteen minutes about yourself and your community, I want to end on this last question, and this is the million dollar question. This is the question that really gets to know your community, Mayor Fair. What makes the village of Alex such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, there's a loaded question. Um. It, you know, it, it, and I kind of touched on this, and I guess to kind of recap that a bit, it's it's the recreational activities, but it's also the people that, um, there's a lot of long-term residents there too. So they they know each other, they look out for each other. Um, you know, you develop some really good relationships. And I mean, every community probably has this. You're, you're going to have people that um, you know are very close, and then you have some that, well, you know, they're maybe not so close, <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's, it's this, the opportunity is, is there um, for connection, looking out for each other, having the, uh, the recreational activities and, and things that you want to do. You're, you're not far away from a larger center if you really need the services too. So it's not like when I was growing up in Northern Saskatchewan, you were kind of on an Island um so you had to be a lot more resourceful because the services weren't close here they are um what we don't have it can be complemented by the services that are close and we're seeing a lot more people looking at you know the affordability of where we live um the space uh, the small town feel and you know just the passion of to do better and, and make it something that everybody can be proud of and enjoy and I, I think that's still prevalent it's got its issues uh you name me a community that doesn't have issues but i'd like to think we've worked really hard to make it a place that everybody can enjoy and feel proud of, of being part of i i know i said that was my last question but you've mentioned it twice now and now you've got my interest perked where in saskatchewan you were you born Boy, there's a there's a story that would probably need a whole other session. <laughs> because uh, I, I, I I really, for the love of me, hope to God that you were born in Turtleford, just for the fact that you can say you lived in Turtleford, you met Turtle there, and now you're an <laughs> Alex the Alligator, and you've met the Alex. I know it's probably a joke, but I think it's just I I, I just it's a interesting. Funny uh, story I, that I put in my I write head. Biography, you're gonna read it and go like, "Wow!" Uh, <laughs> I was actually born in Alberta, so I'm I'm Albertan by by birthright. But um, my family come from the old country and then moved it, and they settled in in across Manitoba and Alberta, or sorry, uh, Saskatchewan. Um, so I grew up for a number of years in in Meadow Lake, which isn't too terribly far from Turtleford. I spent a lot of time at turtle lake which is south of uh of uh, meadow lake so i guess i got that work in my favor but um 
Yeah, I know Meadow Lake quite well. I am originally, well, not originally, but I lived in Lloydminster and I was a reporter up there. So I had to go up to do Meadow Lake a lot. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that's that's kind of where I cut my teeth and, and uh, kind of. Um, but you know, I, wa- I want to well, thank you, Mayor Fair, for doing this. This has, I know I said half hour, 40 minutes, but this conversation has such been such in-depth and such informative for me. And I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule today and just sitting down and talking about your community and yourself. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I, re- I appreciate you reaching out. And uh, and yeah, I, and I guess to close, I, I'd say if you haven't already, you get the opportunity come on by i don't think you'll be disappointed there's a lot of cool things around the area especially in town i certainly will so with that i want to remind everyone go put down social media for at least 10 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody helps our society helps our democracy and helps us be a better people from time to time so with that this has been the cross-border interviews with chris brown have yourself an excellent day and remember everyone keep talking